Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the High Speed Live class. We're going to go ahead and get started, even though that I don't see anybody in the live class yet. Um, I will go ahead and mute everyone and then unmute when we're done. All right. All right, here we go. Let's start out with some common words. Ready? Welcome, sheet, whatever, dollars, o'clock, bills, settlement, miss, mention, local, earliest, fit, receiving, arrived, pleasant, willing, advertising, doesn't, health, fire, hasn't, shown, history, known, seemed, basis, definite, longer, sign, music, proposition, act, blank, follows, march, conditions, Teachers, answering, fact, important, effort, signed, couldn't, machine, plans, teaching, Wednesday, wrong, power, along, allow, quote, story, moment, maybe, expected, teach, eight, carefully, decide, 20, age, etc., women, spend, questions, anyone, university, fee, arrangement, realize, delivered, Post saying may touch agree. All right, moving into some common phrases. Here we go. Ready? Must remember, shall remember, she remembered, she remembers, should have remembered, should remember, so he remembered, so he remembers, so I remember, so I remembered, so you remember, so you remembered, that he remembered, that he remembers, that I remember that I remembered, that you remembered, to have remembered, we remember, we remembered, what he remembered, what he remembers, what I remember, what I remembered, what you remember, what you remembered, what he remembered, when he remembers, when I remember, when I remembered, when you remember, when you remembered, where he remembers, where he remembered, where I remembered, where I remember, where you remember, where you remembered, whether he remembered, whether he remembers, whether I remember, whether I remembered, whether or not he remembered, whether or not he remembers, whether or not I remember, whether or not I remembered, whether or not you remember, whether or not you remembered, whether you remember, whether you remembered. All right. <clears throat> Moving right into a date drill. This focuses on dates. Here we go. February 1st, 1890, January 25, 2016, October 29, 1927, September 3, 2018, November 15, 1817, December 2, 1985, March 30, 1932, August 14, 1941, May 2, 2010, June 5, 1778, July 4, 1956, April 9, 1900. All right. Moving right into some, these are going to be words that start with initial SN, initial SM, as well as initial SP, and initial SW. Ready? Sneer, smell, snow, smart, snit, smite, snail, smoke, snack, smack, snare, small, snag, smile, sneeze, smock, snoop, smear, snooze, smog, snot, smooth, snore, smug, spot, swell, spare, swim, spit, swat, spat, swipe, span, swear, Spoon sweat, spill swan, spike swap, spade sweep, space swag, spate swore. Now these next words are going to start with initial DR, initial TH, and final NS, final NT. Here we go. Drag, thud, drum, thin, droll, then, dream, thought, drain, thug, dress, thaw, drip, them, drill, th theft, drop, thick, drape, Thatch, drool, thigh, drab, thus, dance, ant, chance, vent, flounce, pent, ounce, tent, pounce, went, stance, hunt, trance, taunt, bounce, bunt, lance, rant, 
fence punt, dense runt, sense shunt. All right. State this. I've got some doublets for you, consonant compounds that are doublets. Here we go. Black smoke, cross brace, plate glass, steep grade, breadcrumb, green thumb, fresh prints, strong glare, dry clean, broad cloth, drumstick, snowflake, spo spoils, or excuse me, spoil sport, brown bread, close friend, floor show, plaything, drill press, flat, plain, broomstick, free trip, thrift store, ground swell, drive shaft, slow speed, blood clot, crabgrass, flywheel, flash flood, close shave. All right. I've got some sentences for you. This focuses on consonant compounds that emphasize on initial DW, final RF, final CHD, and initial GR. Here we go, ready? Where does the dwarf dwell? The totals seem to dwindle. The dwelling was abandoned. Tessa's scarf was found in the surf. The wharf is near the turf club. What is her curfew? The great grizzly bear growled at the man. We bought grog at the grocery store. The green trees have grown in the ground. He found a grenade in the graveyard. The grange is near the grove. The grad's grammar was grand. Joe searched for the beached craft. The unlatched gate was watched by the boys. Jay botched the deal. We patched the buggy and hitched up the horses. She matched the thread and stitched the jacket for him. John beseeched her to quit her job when she reached 65. All right. Dating this year. All right, moving right into some Latin and French uh, words. I'm going to give you them and then I will read you your paragraph. Here we go. You're going to hear Mala in say, Nolo, Contendere, Per Curium, and In Flagranti, Delicto. Okay, so In flagranti delicto. And here is your paragraph. Ready? I will read this at 180. <clears throat> Mala in se translates to mean an act which is wrong in and of itself. Acts which are mala in se are wrongs that violate society's morals. A no contest plea is nolo con contendere. Nolo contendere means I do not wish to contend. A per curiam opinion is rendered by the court. Per curiam is a method by which a court may render an opinion as a whole rather than through one specific judge. Mala in se includes robbery, rape, and murder. In a criminal action, nolo contendere means that the guilt is not admitted, although the punishment is accepted. In flagranti, delicto literally means caught in the act of committing a crime. A person caught in in flagranti, delicto, is caught red-handed. <clears throat> All right. I have some legal terms for you. And then I'm going to read you the paragraph. Let's see here. Not the one I wanted. Here it is. Okay. So you're going to hear will, testament, disposed, non cupative, that just means made orally, holographic, handwritten, um, intestate, testate, died, verification, certification, executed, um, addition, attestation, uh, let's see, codicil. That's about it. All right, so I'm going to read this once at 180, again at 200, again at 225. Here we go. Ready? 
before a person dies, he can state in a last will and testament how he wants his property disposed of after his death. A non-cupative will is an oral will. A holographic will is a handwritten will. If a person dies without leaving a will, then that person is said to have died intestate. A person who leaves a will has died testate. A change or addition to a will is called a codicil. The verification or certification appearing at the end of a will, alleging that the will has been properly executed, is, is referred to as the attestation clause. All right, so I'll read that again at 200. Before a person dies, he can state in a last will and testament how he wants his property disposed of after his death. A non-cupative will is an oral will. A holographic will is a handwritten will. If a person dies without leaving a will, then that person is said to have died intestate. A person who leaves a will has died testate. A change or addition to a will is called a codicil, the verification or certification appearing at the end of the will, alleging that the will has been properly executed, is referred to as the attestation clause. All right, so then the last time will be at 225. Here we go. Before a person dies, he can state in a last will and testament how he wants his pro property disposed of after his death. A non-cupative will is an oral will. A holographic will is a handwritten will. If a person dies without leaving a will, then that person is said to have died intestate. A person who leaves a will has died testate. A change or addition to a will is called a codicil. The verification or certification appearing at the end of a will, alleging that the will has been properly executed, is referred to as the attestation clause. All right. Moving right into some literary. I'm going to read this at uh, 180 because it is literary expert testimony. You're going to hear Hindcast, uh, Geotechnical, Analysis, Coastal, Configurations, Adjacent, Residential, um, ADA, Guidelines, Fairways, Cultural Resources, Federal, um, Americans with Disabilities Act or ADA Act, Electrical, All right, uh, marinas, tremendous, aluminum, sanitary, anchorage, all right, so looks like that's about it as far as the word list goes. I'm going to read this at 180. Here we go, ready? Here we go. It is the influence designed from a geotechnical analysis, which is the study of the earth or an understanding of the earth that you're going to be building on top of, understanding the contours of the land, the contours of the ocean bed, understanding all of the environmental constraints, the regulatory framework. You know, how are you going to permit this project? Looking at all the coastal issues, which are numerous, you need to define what sort of wave, climate, and coastal condition will impact this marina. And you have to look at all of the different water levels that are going to impact it from design low water all the way to design high water and what that really means. You have to look at different storm events and actually develop a hindcast. A hindcast is when you take the winds at the closest spot to where you're designing for and typically it's an airport because they record winds over a long period of time. So you take all of these winds and you develop a wave climate based on those winds and then you subject your shoreline to that wave climate. That's called a wave hindcast and you develop it so you can understand what the significance of the wave height is. A significant wave height is the highest one third waves. Those are frequently use for design, you develop the whole coastal environmental condition to actually understand how it will impact your marina. You then look at all of the adjacent land issues. You know, is there residential? Are there resorts? What kind of things 
are around the site that are going to impact it? What are the cultural resources? What are the other environmental restrictions? Are there wetlands? So it's looking at all the different things that are going to impact the site and that forms a basis of design once you understand all these issues. And that's why I say it's evidence-based design. You can start laying out the marina, start looking at the different configurations because there's a prescribed standard set of guidelines. When you start laying out a marina, you have to have certain fairway widths, certain dock widths. How much room do you need between the boats? How much room do you need between different fairways? Start laying that out. How do you get access to all of these slips? Are they floating or are they fixed? You want ADA access and there's a set of governances. So the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, that's getting people that aren't as mobile as you or I to your actual site. And there's the ADA Act, Americans with Disabilities Act, which is a standard for how you lay out the site. It has to do with certain slopes that you cannot exceed. If somebody is in a wheelchair, how do they get to your site? There are a lot of guidelines that you have to follow regarding railings and ramps and things like that so that somebody that's either in a wheelchair or they're walking with a cane or they're not as mobile as you and I can get to the site. Those are all federal guidelines. There's a whole separate part of the ADA guidelines that has to do with recreational boating facilities, and they're a little different. They're different in terms of different size facilities have different requirements, so we have to make sure we comply with all of that. We have to look at all of the utilities, whether they are the storm water or the electrical. Electrical is a very big thing in marinas. They draw a lot of power. Some larger boats will draw 100 amps, the equivalent of your house. So that's a lot of power to bring down to a slip. And actually, mega yacht facilities we're designing now are drawing 400 amps, four times that of a house, what a house draws for one boat. So the electrical is a large thing. And the sanitary, even how you design the docks, are they concrete, are they wood, aluminum, steel? So a lot of things go into the whole design. And then you have to look at the anchorage of it all and make sure that it's going to function with the whole water level change that you have and that it's going to hold in one place out on the bottom. So there's a tremendous amount of work that goes into starting a marina and actually designing it the appropriate way. You typically always provide electrical and you always provide water. Now certain marinas will also have their own sanitary pump out system and boats having holding tanks for the their sanitary wastewater. So a lot of times we'll design marinas that have individual pump outs at every slip. Sometimes we design the sanitary that has a central pump out so that boats will have to go there to pump out their system. All right. <clears throat> Moving right into, um, I wouldn't call this jury charge. It's more um, material on sexual battery. Okay. All right. This is on reform. Okay. There we go. Ready? And I will read this. Um, I'll go ahead and read this at 200. Here we go. Chapter 13 of the Federal Code also covers exclusion of jurors on the basis of race or color, discrimination against a person wearing the uniform of the armed forces, protection of a wide range of activities from election rights to public school enrollment to interstate businesses during a riot and other relief benefits. Let's talk about the sexual battery and reform. Rape, a type of aggregate, aggregated or aggravated battery is so universally abhorrent that it has held its own place as a separate and more serious crime. Unlawful sexual intercourse against the victim's will by force or threat of immediate force could be punished by death until Coker versus Georgia, 1977, declared the death penalty for rape unconstitutional. The intimate nature that makes this offense so serious makes it difficult to discuss and evaluate rigid perceptions of gender roles have also hindered a willingness to be more open in discussing sex crimes. Recently, however, reforms in social attitudes have reached the law, expanding protection against a greater variety of offenses and placing greater emphasis 
on harm to the victim. New statutes increasingly reflect the following changes. Victim testimony, sexual offense trials often pit the word of the victim against the word of the defendant. Traditionally, the victim's credibility had to be bolstered by evidence of her previous chastity and cooperation of witnesses. Her believability dwindled further with any delay in reporting the crime. <clears throat> now, rape shield laws prevent evidence of the victim's prior sexual activity from being introduced in court unless it is relevant to consent. Children can testify in some courts via videotape with the aid of anatomically correct dolls to make the experience less traumatic. Statutes of limitations restricting the time period in which prosecution must be started have been eliminated for sexual offenses against children in 11 states and eliminated without regard to age for the most serious sexual offenses in an additional six states. Many other states have extended time limits. Cooperation may be circumstantial. These changes are not without problems. A defendant's Sixth Amendment right to confront the accuser may be diminished by videotape testimony. Expert opinion that rape trauma syndrome may cause the victim to repress the experience, making difficult the identification of the offender and reporting of the crime is not admissible in some courts as a still questionable and prejudicial theory. Such changes may interfere with the defendant's right to a speedy trial, as well as the timely gathering of the evidence. The old requirement of utmost resistance from the victim has given way to reasonable resistance, taking into account the risk of death or serious injury against overwhelming force or threat, as well as psychological factors, State versus Studham, Utah, 1997. The expectation that all sexual offense victims are female and all offenders male is beginning to change because of the reality of homosexual rape and the involvement of women as accomplices in rape and aggressors in sexual contact cases. New gender neutral statutes attempt to cover all participant, participants and definitions have been expanded to include oral, anal, and vaginal penetration as well as other forms of sexual contact. <clears throat> all right, moving right into some jury selection. Actually, before I give you that, because that is, um, that includes the light board, I'm going to give you some jury charge, and then we'll go right into <clears throat> jury selection. I will read this at 200. Here we go, ready? You're going to hear conclusions, client, details, blended, defender, enforced, confused, connected, conclusions, discussions, disinterested, organizing, favorable, restrictions, interested. Here we go. Members of the jury, you and I are not like the attorneys. We must remain disinterested if pure right is to succeed. Of course, the plaintiff and the defendant are interested, but as a juror, you should only concern yourself with the facts in the case. I will now explain to you what the law is in the case. I will explain what is legal and what is not legal in relation to the evidence in this case. I will not instruct you as to the decision you should reach because it is your duty to reach your own conclusions about the facts in the case, regardless of what you think my opinion may be. After all the evidence has been presented to you, and after the court has read the instructions to the jury, which is the law to be applied to the facts, the attorneys for both sides make their judgments and arguments to you. These so-called arguments are re really discussions of evidence as seen from each party's point of view. These Discussions are important to you because in them, the attorneys sum up the main points for their side. They may help you recall many details in the testimony that might have left your memory. It is here that the attorneys effect their main service to the juror by organizing the evidence into a blended picture, fitting all of the parts into a connected story. No longer is the case a confused number of facts. Naturally, each attorney, being a defender, presents the side most favorable to his client. Remember that these opening and closing arguments of the attorneys are not evidence. You must disregard any statement which you do not think was proved by the evidence and always disregard any attorney's account about the law of the case if it was not included in the court's instructions. Now that you are ready to retire to the jury room for your deliberation, it is more important than ever that you remain unbiased. This is why from now until a decision is reached, jurors must always remain together. 
Most of the time, this will be in the jury room. Naturally, restrictions must be enforced. During deliberation, bailiffs will be in charge of the jury. Both male and female bailiffs are on hand to assist you in every possible way. The bailiff is not only your escort, but when you are in your deliberation, he or she is always just outside the jury room to handle any wants you might have. At mealtimes, he takes the jurors as a group to and from the eating place. During all meals, as well as other times, you must not talk with any outsider. And of course, you cannot read newspapers, books, or magazines, listen to your radio or television. After you retire to the jury room to consider your verdict, how should you proceed? As you choose, of course, but your decision may be less difficult if you have a wise plan to follow. A four-person must be selected. Your choice is an important one. The four-person should give every juror an equal chance to express their views. He or she must guide the deliberation so that it does not stray and become involved in general statements. The deliberation is not a place for confused emotions, but a place for a calm reviewing of facts. As a juror, you must enter into the discussion with an open mind and freely exchange your opinions with the others. Do not hesitate to change your original views. If through your deliberations you become convinced your views were incorrect. All right, now we will move into our light board. This is going to be jury selection. So it, it is colloquy. All right, it's going to start off with uh, the court. Here we go, ready? Are we doing on time? Good. All right, here we go. Now, on the questionnaire that you get, we have attached a list of the witnesses. Not necessarily every witness is going to be called, but you'll be able to go over it and see if you know anybody, and there's a place you can write about that. But for right now, I'm going to have the DA introduce himself and the defense attorneys introduce themselves. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. My name is Sean Lafferty. I'm the prosecutor here in the County of Riverside. I will be representing the people of the state of California in this action. Good morning. My name is Chris Jensen, one of the two defense attorneys. Good morning. My name is Chad Firetag. I also represent Brooke Rodders. Thank you very much. Now, I have the summary right here. Do you want me to read it out loud? Are you okay with that, or should they just read it in the questionnaire? You're welcome to read it, Your Honor. This is the questionnaire. Sometimes we duplicate things. Here's the essence of the case. Remember, these are just allegations. These are not the facts yet. The facts come from the stand and any evidence items introduced. Brooke Marie Rodders, Omar Hutchinson, Francine Epps are charged with the murders of Mar Marvin Gabriel, age 22, and Milton Chavez, age 28. They are also charged with two special circumstances alleging that the murder was committed during the commission or attempted commission of the crime of robbery, and that the defendants did commit multiple murders. On August 27th of 2006, Marvin Gabriel and Milton Chavez were last seen leaving a bar in Riverside. It is alleged that both men were mur murdered at the National Inn Motel located at 420 South Lincoln Street in Corona on August 29, 2006. Their bodies were found in the trunk of a car located in the Gavlin Springs area of the inn or unincorporated area of Riverside County near Lake Matthews. The next thing we're going to cover is qualifications. The jury commissioner has determined that you're qualified to do this job, but I am going to go over them again just to make sure a, you have to be a citizen of the United States. B, 18 years of age. C, living in the state of California. D, resident of Riverside County. E, not previously convicted of malfeasance in office. Or C, not convicted of a felony and not had your civil rights restored. F, I'm sorry, it was F, sufficient knowledge of the English language. G, not currently serving on a grand jury or any other kind of jury. H, not subject to conservatorship proceedings. Anybody who thinks one of these things applies to you, please raise your hand. Okay, the jury commissioner in the corner, what's your name? My name is Valdemar Guzman. What is your issue? My issue is I don't speak English very well and I don't understand English too much. Thanks. We'll get back with you. Thank you. Now, at the very end, before you go out and deliberate, you get a copy of them. Don't try to memorize anything. I'll give them to you one right now. This is a shortened version of the CalCrim 100. You must not talk about the case with anyone. Do not allow anyone to talk to you about the case. You must not do any research on the internet or anywhere else. 
Avoid reading any media accounts about the case. That's a real basic right there. After it's over, you can talk about it all you want. But while it's happening, you can't even talk to each other about it. Deliberations happen in the jury deliberation room, not in the hallway, not at lunch, nowhere else. So you listen, pay attention. And then when you get together in the jury deliberation room, that's when you talk about everything, okay? Wear your juror badges so others will know to avoid you and not to talk to you. The attorneys, myself, court clerk, may seem a little unfriendly. If we just stop to chat about the weather, everybody else is suspicious. It's better to avoid any appearance of impropriety. They're all good attorneys. I have no problem. I know they're not going to do the wrong thing. We don't even want to look like we are doing the wrong thing, okay? Next, we'll determine if you should be excused because jury service would impose an undue hardship. The law is very strict regarding the granting of hardships. The law views jury service not only as a privilege of citizenship, but as an obligation of citizenship. If we selected only jurors who had nothing else to do, we would have a narrow cross-section of society. Experience shows us that a broad cross-section of society, making these important decisions is a better way to go. In a moment, I will listen to any claims of undue hardship. I will then make an evaluation based on the law and make a decision, okay? So there's people who know you can serve the time. I'm going to send you to the jury assembly room to fill out the questionnaire and then put you, you can go home and come back on May 3rd. I've got a piece of paper I'm going to give you. So those people who can serve the time, I'm going to send you out first. Okay, are we ready? On my left side, those who feel like you can serve the time, get up and take a piece of paper and go down to the jury assembly room and fill it out. Take one of each of those things. <clears throat> the rest of you are the ones who you think you might have some problem with the time element, or one man thinks he might have a language problem. I want you all to go outside. This is kind of the messy part because there's so many people in here. I'll call you in one at a time and we'll talk it over and see what is what. So juror number one, you stay there. Everybody else wait outside. Please tell me your name. My name is Ron Lozano with an L. Yes, what is your situation? I'm the main provider for my family of six. I'm a lead engineer for the local company here. My concerns are financial reasons. I don't know if my employer will cover for that long of a stay. We have two main engineers for our company. It would create a great hardship for the company. What is the name of your company? It is Bonner Supply. How big is it? About over 100 employees. So you feel it's a company problem that they wouldn't pay for that period? I'm afraid of losing my job if I'm out that long. Here is what I am going to do. We're going to excuse you and send you to the jury room. Tell them you can serve today, but you have to serve on a shorter trial. You're excused. As you go out, tell the next person to come in. Come on up, tell me your name. My name is Adrian Mendoza. What is your situation? That I work in construction. I have a house payment, two kids. I'm an apprentice, so I get to keep up with my hours, my insurance, and I have, my insurance is going to raise. Where do you work? I'm a line worker. Who do you work for? Union 416. You just go out on jobs and different jobs. Construction, if I don't go, they give my spot to somebody else. Today I had to go. I missed my spot, so I got to call in today to have work for tomorrow. You still have to serve, not necessarily a long one, but you do have to sacrifice privileges. Today, that just happens. I'm not going to make you serve on a long one. I'll send you back down to the jury room, but you do have to serve on a shorter trial, one that's part of being a citizen. So report to the jury room. Tell them you can serve, but only on a shorter trial. Go back down there now. Send in the next person, please. Come on up to the podium. Tell me your name. Sean Thompson. And what is your situation? I currently have a lien on my income, so it would be another dip in my bad financial situation in terms of missing rent or utility bills. Where do you work? I work at a Rite Aid night shift supervisor. What are you talking about lean? What do you mean lean? I have a credit card. They take a chunk out of my check, out of every paycheck. I can't afford to have the days off. I won't make as much on the night premium. I'm going to excuse you, report to the jury room, and tell them that you can serve, but only on a shorter jury. Send in the next person, please. Come on up to the podium. Tell me your name. Eric Holyfield. Okay, Mr. Holyfield, what is your situation? Looking at the schedule, Your Honor, it's kind of an inconsistent for my schedule going to work. I commute 80 miles one way. I work six days a week and go to school at night. And I think the schedule you have planned out, plus going into the trial, it would really be, where do you work? I work in LA, born aircraft. 
That sounds like a long drive. I hope you like Riverside, but I'm going to excuse you. Report to the jury room and maybe they can tell you or you can tell them you need to serve on a shorter trial. It's on the second floor jury room and send in the next person. Thank you. Come on up to the podium. Tell me your name. Regina Subna, S-U-B-N-A. Tell me your situation. Well, it would be quite a financial problem for my husband and I. His job hasn't been very good for the last two years, and my income is what we pay our bills with and run our, where do you work? A dog and cat boarding facility in Whittier, California. You said your husband isn't working right now? He's self-employed, but he's the only employee he has, and the business has been really slow because of the economy. Nobody is putting in a lot of landscaping these days. I'm going to send you back down to the jury room. Tell them you can serve, but on a shorter trial. Send in the next person. Thank you. Come on up to the podium, please. My name is Sana Takif, T-A-W-K-I-F-F. -F -F. What is your situation? When somebody talks very fast English, I can't understand. And also, I cannot understand the big word. My English is second language. Do you work? I'm working for a series. You're just concerned that you might miss words here and there. Yeah, I cannot understand big words. Okay, I want you to go back outside. We're going to call you in. This is going to be a lot of waiting. Go back to the end of the line and then I'm calling you back in. So right now, I want you to send in the next person and then go at the very end of the line and I'll call you back in again at the end. Tell me your name, Rosalina Hernandez. Okay, ma'am, tell me your situation. I have an infant to care for and I just don't feel that I'm best for the case. I have trouble focusing. I'm a little emotionally, that's okay, that's part. That part is normal, everything is serious, but what about the child? Do you have your parents, kids, grandparents who can help you? My mom, you know, I have my mom who can drop her off if she's not doing anything, but you know, I never know. I'm going to excuse you, report to the jury room and tell them that you can serve, but on a shorter jury trial. Send in the next person, please. Do you want to excuse the lady who had trouble with English? Yes, yes. I suppose you want to go tell her, ma'am, go ahead, tell me your name. My name is Nancy Harrison. What is, go ahead. Yes, what is your situation? I have a disabled grandson that is graduating high school June 2nd in Boise, Idaho, and I have plans to go there from June 2nd. How many days were you planning on going? I was going to leave on the 2nd and come back on the 14th. So that's a vacation, right? Yes, I'm going to excuse you. You can go down and just tell them that you can serve on a shorter trial. Send in the next person, please. All right. So that was at 200. Now we're going to do just some regular Q&A. All right, this is going to start with defense. How are we doing on time? Good, <coughs> excuse me. All right, I will start this at 200 and work my way to 225. Okay, here we go. Ready? Now, Stephen, can you recall the exact date that you went into the service? Yes, it was November 17, 2009. What branch of the service did you go into, Stephen? The Air Force. Had you considered other branches of the service, the Army, the Navy, or the Marines? Yes, I had investigated all the branches but decided on the Air Force because they could give me the kind of training and travel opportunities that I wanted. Now, when you joined were you considering a four six or ten year hitch or some other length of time i knew i would be in for four years maybe longer if i liked it okay were you required to attend boot camp yes i was where did you attend boot camp at the base right outside of san antonio texas how long were you there for boot camp about three months but it seemed like forever at some point in time during this basic training were you injured while performing some physical exercises? Yes, I was. Please explain to us what happened exactly. I was involved in the obstacle course and field test maneuvers. I was attempting to scale a 10-foot wooden wall when I somehow lost my grip and fell to the ground. How far would you estimate that you fell, sir? About eight feet. Did you land on your feet? Yes, I did, but my left leg was somewhat twisted. It buckled under me when I landed. I lost my footing and then fell to the ground. Were you able to get up and walk? No, when I tried to walk, the pain was terrible. Did anyone come to your aid? Yes, after about five minutes, another boot camp or another boot came over to my assistance. He helped me over to where the drill instructor was standing. 
Were you then escorted to the base hospital? Yes, the drill instructor told two of the other boots to help me to the base hospital. What was the nature of your injury? My leg was broken in three places and I had a dislocated shoulder. Were you transferred to Houston at that time? Yes, I was. How long did you remain in Houston? About three days while they ran some tests and took some more x-rays. What was your physical condition at that time? I was in a lot of pain. My leg was all swollen and my shoulder ached constantly. Were you given any type of drugs to relieve the pain? Yes, I was given codeine and morphine every three hours. After your stay in the Houston hospital, were, where were you transferred to? They sent me to the Air Force Hospital near Dallas for further treatment and observation. How did you progress? Not very well. After about two weeks, I was still in a tremendous amount of pain. I couldn't sleep at night without pain meds. Was a specialist of any kind called in to examine your leg and your shoulder? Not that I know of. What doctors do you recall attending to you in Houston? Dr. Barton and Dr. Hawthorne. What doctors do you recall attending to you in Dallas? Just Dr. Gregory. He came by every morning to see if I was doing better, but that was about it. When did you first begin to experience loss of sensation in your, in your left lower limb? I first noticed it about three weeks after the accident when my foot was always numb. I mentioned this to the nurse who notified the doctor. Did they remove the cast at that time? Yes, they did remove it and began another series of x-rays and tests. Was a specialist called in at that time? Yes, Dr. Winters from Fort Worth. All right, so we're going to switch up. <clears throat> Q&A. And looks like this is going to start with defense. There we go. I'll, uh, I'll read this at 225. What are the documents that appear to be found on pages 10 through 17? Those are photocopies of our general index that the documents are compiled in, and those are references as to what documents are contained within those indexes. Would this be a geographic index? Yes. How is the geographic index set up or maintained? Again, it's found by looking for a geographic index on a particular block that you're searching. Block for a reference to lands, the LDS. Okay, all right. Now, page 10 has an underline with a date, 125.14. What is... CTF, what does that mean? That is just a reference for a certificate or sale, as in certificate of sale, as in there is a lot of documents that come under different headings, but it's just a beginning of a word or a phrase that would have the word certificate in it. What is the information and remarks signify? That's just our title plan codings of the type of documents or information that would possibly be contained within it. What does the letters PT signify? A portion. A portion? Just the word portion of block 181. And the word sale, what does that signify? A sale of something that had happened. Okay, is any of the writing on page 10 in your handwriting? No. The next number. There are a number of entries following the one you've just read. Am I correct that they all refer to the same property? They all refer to documents that would possibly affect block 181 of that geographical index. The blue numbers circled, are those pages numbers? Well, those are there, the document that would be found, yes. Following page 17, there appears to be a number of documentary state type of documents which include legal description, etc. Are these documents that are pulled from other files by the searcher to be placed in the packet? Those are pulled out of geographical index. I will warn you, Terry, that I happen to prepare a copy of that for you. I don't know that it will be a good copy while one is a copy of the copy already, although it's our original file. Okay, what's the significance of the document on page 59? That is, depending on the type of search that we are doing, it is just other information that we would add to a report and it's just coded accordingly. Well, it had circled there, are no deeds conveyed within the last six months. Does that mean that someone has gone to a public record or records source to see if there are any recordations on this property within the last six months? Yes. You went down to the county recorder's office, or is that within your own information? No, First American has copies of all of the documents recorded daily. There appear to be maps, is that correct? Yes. Are these maps, to your knowledge, all the maps that were in existence at the time the title search was done? Yes. I have arrived at a pink sheet with a small page taped to it. What is this pink sheet? 
when a person requests that a search be started, that's the sheet that the information is taken down as to the information for the search. Is this in your handwriting as well? No, it is not. That's not my writing. Do you have any knowledge as to who completed this page? No, you do not recognize the handwriting. It could be, well, yes, I do. All right, whose handwriting does it appear to you to be in? Possibly Kelly Young or the chief title officer. Is there anything on the form which indicates who filled it out? No. Okay, off the record, back on the record. Do you have any recollection of ever seeing this page prior to today? Other than at the time that I examined it, at the time of the report, when it was searched. This page says, taken by Tom Powers. Does that signify that you are the one that received the order from Mr. Brandt? Yes, no, I'm sorry. That's just the reference as to who would be handling the title order. There are many people within our office who can open an order and that just represents who the title officer would be. Are the order numbers in sequence at First American? Yes. Are they kept in certain places so that, so that each officer assigning an order number, how are they kept? How do you determine what order number to use? There is not, there is just a packet that's given to each title unit with a numerical sequence of orders. As each request is made of us, we just pull one out and assign that order to it, that order number. Would it be fair, would it be a fair conclusion that an order number with an next number in sequence would have been taken, an order would have been taken about the same time as this order, within a day or so, yes. Do you know what the words notes called 3.45 p.m. mean? Well, when the order opened, there was a request that a previous search had been done, you know, order number 1162042, and that's the date that the notes were called to retrieve that start. What does the words notes reference? A prior preliminary title report. Is there someone there named? I think that's him. Oh, okay, the word him? I think so, it's not my handwriting, but it could be 90. Please give him a call when it's ready. That's what I would assume from the sentence. All right, do you know who the writing on the white sheet is that's attached to it is assuming that it's someone different? Some of it is mine, the others I don't recognize. What portion is yours? The reference to recollection. Excuse me. It says recollection of all of the items above are DA, is that correct? Yes, what does DA mean? That means doesn't affect. Are doesn't affect? What does doesn't affect mean in the terminology as you used it? What is an item which it doesn't affect? Well, something that wouldn't have any bearing on the property. Okay, was this a response to a request that was asked in the black ink above it? Yes, do you remember? I'm sorry, I really don't remember. Okay, what are the items above that are, that are referred to? You could possibly have been no telling off the record. This phone order sheet, I guess we ought to make this one an exhibit. Do you want to go, do you want to go Xerox it? Would you like to copy it? The only problem is I'm happy to have him guess and speculate, but it is evidence that he didn't prepare it. The only part is that he really is competent to this own, to his own handwriting. He can talk about general procedures, I do. This phone order sheet says present owner, question mark, J.E. Wetson Inc., or could be vested in Oscar G. Tritt, or both. Do you have any recall of the names Weston and Tritt having been considered as possible owners of this property? No, go ahead, counsel. Certainly the fact that their names are shown on the phone order as well as the front page itself, the brief, signifies that you would have considered them as possible owners, is that correct? Consideration should be made, yes. That is the basis for the name search, is that correct? Right, do you know if a name search was done as a part of the preparation of this packet? Yes, there was. How do you know that? You turn to another page in the packet. It's gold. It has the same order number in the upper right-hand corner. It has the words in the, about the top center of GI run sheet. Does, what does that mean? General index. Is any of the writing on this gold GI run sheet in your handwriting? No. This sheet does signify that the names shown on it were all considered or searched. Is that it? Considered, yes. All right, what does that mean then to have a name considered so we know what we are talking about? It depends on the searcher if he feels like running them. Running means what? Well, actually doing the search of the name. For instance, as the names are put in, then nothing had been done. Yes, there has been times that our searchers in haste or negligence or whatever might be, they might put a name down. You said as long as the names are put on, nothing has been done? No, go ahead, counsel. No, 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 counsel. 
that was what was read back. That's what he said. Yeah, but that's what you said. Let's take the record. Let's let's let the record reflect that there has been a rereading of the sentence of the witness, which included the phrase, nothing had been done. We're now trying to determine whether that has stated, as the reporter put it down, did you say, what did you say? Do you recall? Names have been put down, but nothing has been done. Sometimes, all the time, sometimes. All right, do you have any knowledge in this case whether any of the names were run or were not run? We have to take it on faith that in fact the searcher did that. Is there any way that the searcher indicates he did it? He just dates the report of his run if he has in fact done it per the plant date. All right, what does, what did the code numbers show respectively mean if you know? When we do a name search, there is a system called a Russell Soundex code that our geographical or our general index is based upon. It's a coding of the individual's last name and accordingly we go to the records and search it on the Russell Soundex code. Could you spell Russell Soundex code R-U-S-S-E-L-L, -S -S -E then S-O-U-N-D-S-E-X, I believe. Sound sex, S-O-U-N-D-E-X. Okay, does the entry of the code mean at least the searcher looked up the code that is designated in the person's name? Yes, then the column subcode number one, what does that mean? Okay, well, some names are so familiar, such as Smith or Jones or Taylor, that they have their own individual portion of our index that we would search. Sub portion, yes. Okay, can you tell whether a sub portion even exists without even actually searching the name or running the name? No. Does the fact that there is a reference to a subcode strongly suggest that a searcher actually went into the subcode? No, it's just that he was able to identify that the name is under a subcode. Okay, all right. Is there any way to identify without searching the name or running the name? No. The from and to dates signify what dates they owned in the property or what? Those are the dates that the searcher had run the names within the time frame. All right, now across from Beach Coach Specialties, there are no dates known. So does that signify he did not run the date, that name? I don't know that. You don't know whether there are no dates shown? Right. Does the absence of the dates have any common meaning in First American's plan? No. Across from Jane Landers, are the dates 21105? Then what appears to be a letter D, is that correct? Right, that would, D would represent the name the date of the plant, and it was run on 21105 to the plant date. Do you see that? Yes, apparently the searcher signifies that he, Oscar Tritt, to February 11th, and then something that he saw led him to go and run Jane Landers from February 11th on, is that correct? I don't know what he was thinking at that time. All right, GI means what? General index, JDGT means what? Judgments, the checks have what? What is that significant? What is the significance of the checks? Well, supposedly those are the books he checked. All right, do you know what the significance of the numbers on lines 24 and five are? No, is it true that pages have been added to the packet that existed at the time of the actual search? The actual preliminary report was completed? No, and other unnumbered documents was submitted to our office after the date of the search. That's correct, all right. What are these five, eight and a half by five pages? Those represent a tax search of the property. How is that accomplished? By the tax assessor parcel number. Are these computer runs of some sort? Yes. Do you have an in-house computer that gives you the information? Of course, yes. Do these specify whether the taxes have been paid on the property? Yes. Do they specify who is paying the taxes on the property? It would specify who the county has deemed an owner or possible owner of the property. Next, there appears to be a carbon copy of the actual preliminary report. Is that correct? Yes you would have the attached, the lender's appraisal document, is that correct? That's a supportive information of the search, yes. Do you know the source of the photographs that are in the packet? Supposedly the appraiser. The next document is a carbon copy of the actual interim binder, is that correct? Yes, off the record, back on the record. These old, old grant deeds which are shown from the years 1963 on each, do you know the process by which they got into the packet? No, I don't based on what appears, you said they would have been submitted after the search was done or found after the search was done. Usually anything that's not contained within our numerical sequence, there are times we have no idea how things get put into our search because once it leaves our unit, it could be put into the storage area or something of that nature and anybody in our office has access to the files. Now, interestingly, page 50 appears far behind in a lot of the other documents that have been added as it 
is it correct that the actual sequence is not always maintained? Yes, evidently. We have a Marshall's document showing a case of Nixon versus Myers. Do you know what that, what is in that package? That is an attachment. It was part of the chain of title. All right. All right. So I'm going to just uh, close with a last uh, Q&A for you. <clears throat> and uh, I will read this at 200, just about five more minutes and then we'll be done. Here we go. Ready? When did the MasterCard start September? September was when it was opened. It first started being used. That's right. And we were still reconciling through December. I don't know. I can urge them to comply. You can bring a motion to compel production. We didn't have to respond to their request to the discovery that they had. It wasn't timely. We registered objections for the record, but then we provided the stuff, the records. He was still trying to get together and we brought copies in but now you will be timely on any requests. So if you don't feel you have everything, we were timely, Your Honor, quite timely. I don't know, then bring a motion to compel. We were timely though. We couldn't do a motion to compel because counsel didn't answer our production requests for two and a half weeks and we were coming up to a trial. Then we couldn't do anything. So we are here the first time today and received our first copies of the documents. Your Honor, we would request an award of attorney's fees through for that can be taken up at the time of trial. Okay, Your Honor. All right, so that's September 24th at eight o'clock, Your Honor. Yes, thank you. Is Netter your case? That was this one, Your Honor. Oh, here's for custody and visitation. You want to review this, and if it's acceptable, the stip orders? Yeah, the stipulated agreement. Okay, thank you. Matter of Netter and Netter. Appearances for the record, please. Yes, Your Honor. William Anderson on behalf of the petitioner who's present in court. Marla Hendrickson of Norman, Norman Filer's office for respondent Cindy, Cindy Netter. She is present. All right, counsel, I have indicated to you in chambers yesterday I could give you between 9 and 10 this morning. It's now 7 after 9, so we have between now and 10 o'clock. We discussed some of the trial issues yesterday, and Mr. Anderson, you are the petitioner. Would you like to outline the trial issues from your standpoint? Well, Your Honor, I think it's the custody and visitation order that was made. All right, let's not talk about custody and visitation right now. Let's talk about factual trial issues. We have the issue of the $120,000 check from the petitioner's parents to the parties. There's the issue, $120,000 loan issue. What else? There's the issue of the ownership of the jacuzzi and whether or not there's any amount owed to the respondent's mother. Ownership of the, it's a portable spa, correct? Correct. We have the support issue. Support. All right. Spousal. We have attorney's fees. We were able to make headway on dividing some of the personal property. There are several items left as there's a dispute as to characterization and possession. I mentioned attorney's fees and costs. Yes, there's an issue as to the characterization of the 2009 Ford Escort. There are Epstein credits requested of the petitioner anyway. The house, I think we agreed, needs to be sold. How the proceeds need to be distributed was another issue. I believe that. Ms. Hendrickson, do you agree with these particular trial issues? Yes, Your Honor, we do think there's an additional issue, though, as to the fair rental value of the house, which Mr. Netter has resided continuously in since the separation in October of 2015. I thought you agreed to that yesterday in Chambers. No, Your Honor, we did not agree to that. We indicated that there was a, what do you think a fair rental value is? We believe the fair rental value is $19.50 a month, and he is in, Mr. Anderson, we believe it's $18.50, and we would agree to $1,900. Ms. Hendrickson, $1,900? Yes, for the purposes of resolution. The court finds the reasonable rental value to be $1,900. Any other issues, Ms. Hendrickson? There's an issue of spousal support, Your Honor. He's already mentioned that. Mr. Anderson has outlined what he feels the trial issues are. My question to you is, are these the trial issues? Are there more or less? That appears to be the extent of the issues at this time. Good, all right, let's start with the issue number one, the issue concerning the loan. Mr. Anderson, can I call Cindy Netter? Mrs. Netter, please come forward. Would you take, would you raise your right hand, please? All right. So that concludes our high speed live class. Have a great day.